It's after Hatzot, so I can say good afternoon. How are you? Are you holding? I always wait for this moment to be able to look at you. To see you. You look beautiful. Really. I've missed you. I'd like to ask everybody before we begin if we could take a moment to consider why we're here, just to come back to the book. It doesn't have to be a cosmic reason, just maybe you just got stuck from you know, the last class and get out of time. <laughs> it's okay. What I want to share with you this afternoon. I'm grateful for the honor to be able to do so. Very grateful. It's not a complicated uh, issue or subject. It's something that you likely will have heard me speak of in some way, shape, or form before. I've spoke about, I've spoken about it five years ago on to Shabbat in a different form. And I had to consider whether I'm ready or want to do it again and it isn't for want of other subjects. But for me, it seems to me that this is among the most important. And it seems to me that way not only from life experience, but from Torah. And so what I'd like to attempt to do with you this afternoon is to show you from Torah that this is so There have been times in my life where people have said, you know, maybe you're a bit in a wave or in wage, or whatever the case may be. Not a lot sometimes. And, and I wonder, maybe the Torah doesn't come through. Maybe the things that I say or the, uh, you know, the thoughts that I might share, it's that the Torah doesn't come through. And so I want to make sure that we do that. That you see where, where it's coming from. And what I'm going to speak with you today is not something that I am imposing on to Tisha B'Av, that I genuinely believe is the essence of Tisha B'Av. So if you'll come with me, I will try to take you there. Here we go. If uh, we get this. Oh, okay, let's go. Is that Emily? Emily, thank you. Naturally, we're starting with Harambam. Harambam says at the beginning of the fifth period of Hilchot Ta'anit, first halacha, Yesh Sham Yamim, which literally means there are days. Yesh Sham, there are days. Shekol Yisrael mit'anim bahem, that the entirety of Israel deprives themselves on this day. On these days. That's literally what ta'anit means. Anui means deprivation. Tzom is a fast. Part of deprivation is not eating and drinking. But there are days that all of Israel deprive themselves. The reason they do this is because of the hardships that occurred on these days at a certain point in history. And then he says, why we do this? First he tells you there are these days of deprivation. Then he says, this is why we deprive. Kedeh, in order to. We deprive ourselves in order to keep our minds about us. To awaken our hearts. To open pathways to return. Open pathways to Tishuba, which is literally what Tishuba means. Tishuba is return. We've been somewhere else and we want to return. And so we call our minds to attention by deprivation. Anytime that the Achamim wants you to remember something, they tell you not to eat. 
Don't forget to say Sefirah Da Omer, right? Don't eat before you say Sefirah Da Omer. Don't eat before you light the candles of Hanukkah. Don't lie. Don't eat before you pray Mincha. Don't eat before you say Kiddush. Don't eat before you search for Hamids and so on and so forth. You've heard this all, of course, right? And they know what they're doing, of course. Because if you're not eating, you're wondering why. <laughs> if I didn't have lunch, I'm definitely wondering why. And how can you know that? They know us well. They know our psychology. And so they say, don't eat before you do this, because they know you'll question why I'm not eating, and they'll do it. This is a day of not eating. This day of not eating and drinking and engaging on this one, like Yom Kippur, in things that would otherwise distract us, pad us, comfort us, are to be removed so that our minds are kept stark and focused. Of course, we'll have a tendency to do the distractions in any other number of ways that are not legislated, but nonetheless, the Akamim want us to get the idea. So they said, Allah says, the reason for this is to awaken our hearts so that we shall return. And it will be a zikaron. Zikaron means it will be a memory. It will be called to our awareness. What are we aware of? Ma'asinu hara'im, we're on the third line. Lema'asinu hara'im ma'asinu hara'im ma'asinu 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 This is an important line. I'd like to pause here with you for a moment. Not that the others aren't, but this is to be highlighted. He says because we have to be aware of the fact that the difficult things that occurred on these days that we're commemorating didn't happen by fluke. There was a result of interface between us and the world and how the world responds to us. And so our actions are not so great. There are certain areas that our actions could be better. But the thing that he points out, Haramah, is, and it's just like our forefathers. We're doing the same thing. It says, Kama maasenu. Right, let's look at it again. Maasenu arayim. U maase abotenu shehayat maasenu adam. Our deeds and our forefathers deeds that are just like our deeds are today. So there is a generational development. Right? It trickles down through generations. You see this? Yes? Can I get some thumbs? I just want to make sure with me. There is a generational process here. We live what our parents live, what their parents live, what their parents live. We do that in good ways, we do that sometimes in not so good ways. And Harambam is calling our attention to that on a fast day, on the fast days, in a more negative way. He's saying we've got to be aware that we're doing things that have been done for a long time within our families, our nation, because at the end of the day, we are a national family. We started with one set of parents and 12 kids. And busy flowing of the Rambam says, when we remember these things, when we pay attention to these things, attention is the first step. We look at it. We bring it before us. So if that's the case, if first of all we have to be able to look at things that are not necessarily so comfortable to look at, that's number one. And number two, we have to be able to recognize that these are not spontaneously developed, that these are old. The best thing to do would be to go back as far as we can. Where did it start? If we can look at where it started, we can somehow pinpoint at least an aspect, we can look at different things, but we'll look at at least one aspect. I believe what I'm going to share with you is the central aspect, the most central, that you can argue with, that you know, very happy afterwards to discuss it, but this is my suggestion. If we go back to the origin, we look at the origin, we can begin to start to sense how I, here, now, Tafshim, it had it. That's great. Amazing that it is. 2021. How do I, here, in my life, address? Now, when I say that, I say that not in the sense that we are going to completely address this. We have to be accepting that that's not necessarily in our hands to do. We have to know what we can control and what we can't. 
But we can begin to question, what can I do in my space, in my life, that relates back to the origins? So here's the origin. It's at the top. And Obama says that there were five things that occurred on Tisha B'Av. The first one is what we're going to look at today. And the first one is It was decreed by God on this day back over 3,000 years ago as we were standing on the threshold of the promised land at the response of a report of spies who had been sent in for a reconnaissance mission before we did so that came back with a powerful negative report we are not going in, instead we're detouring, and we're going to do a 40-year wandering. That decree and judgment occurred today. That is the earliest occurrence that was difficult for us, negative, what have you, that we know in our tradition occurred on this day. So that's where we're going to go. Can we go there? With me? Okay, just checking. We're going to go there. We're going to look at that. What I want to do is look at that episode for you, and I want to examine that episode in terms of the core issue. And the, and the core issue is, well, let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm imagining that you more or less are familiar with this. So 12 tribes are sent in by, sorry, 12 spies are sent in by Moshe Rabbeinu. They spend 40 days and 40 nights in the land. They come back and they say it's a no-go. Call it off. We should go back to Egypt. And the people hear this and panic. They have no other way of knowing what's going on on the other side of the Jordan River. They just panic. There are two who counter the report, and they are Kalev and Yoshua. It's Kalev and Yoshua. And what Kalev and Yoshua say is that they're wrong. So what I want to do is look at what they said. So they say, look, you know, I mean, it's a beautiful land. Here's the produce. We brought some fruit back. It's beautiful. I mean, it is flowing with milk and honey. That was not, that was not incorrect. The only problem is, is that the people who live in that land are insanely massive people. They're formidable. They're dangerous. They're much more powerful than we are. So, we're not going. But I want to call your attention to one specific line. And that's at the bottom here. They say, the Sham, see it's the second last line, the Sham, in that place, We saw the Nephilim, these giants. Okay, so you saw the giants, that's interesting. Maybe a little bit scary. But the next line is what they thought about seeing the giants. And they say this. They say, They say, we were in our eyes like grasshoppers. Like insects. So it's not just we were weaker, right? Let's pay attention to this. It's not just we were smaller than them. We didn't have the same kind of artillery that they do. We weren't as set up. We were insects. And now it doesn't even stop there. Because if that was it, maybe we would have something to work with. But it doesn't stop there. What they say is not only were we like insects in our eyes, that's how they saw us. How do you know how they saw us? You know what we know about how they saw us? You read the next book, Seven Yoshua, when Moshe, when Yoshua sends a couple of spies into the land, and they meet up with Rahab, and she says that, oh, you don't even know what is happening here. You don't even know. We are scared to death. 
of you people coming in. People, people can barely get out of bed. And you want to know why? Because they heard about Yamsuf, which was 40 years ago, mind you, they cannot sleep at night. They are forcing themselves into walled cities so that they can be protected when you come in. That's what's actually going on on the ground. <clears throat> it's not what they see. They have now completely defined an entire scenario based on how they see themselves and how they are therefore convinced everybody else sees them. It was me. This Ahayotai Ve'ahai is the source of Tushara. It is here, in that line, where Tushara is going. And if what Harabam is saying is correct, which of course is Harabam, that what is happening now has been happening for generations, and the acts of our fathers is like ours today. It's not an easy thing to hear. For me, I'm just sharing. For me, it's not an easy thing to hear. Because it means that on some level, if I'm going to address the Shabbat, I have to work on how it is that I see myself and how I leave others see me. And I have to pause and pay attention to both my overcompensations and my undercompensations. By overcompensations, I mean what I do to build myself, present myself in broader, bigger terms than I in here believe I am. Undercompensation, I mean pulling myself lower than I am. And if we are honest with ourselves, we do both at various times. I am okay right now, on this day, to say, if you think that I'm the only one, I'll take it. If that's what's happening for you right now, that's okay, I'll take it. Maybe I'm the only one. Somewhere, somehow, what I share with you today may some, in some way help for us to become aware of how we think of ourselves. And, and it's important because it changed everything. It literally framed the entire experience, judgment, response to that scenario. It ended up shutting the doors for us to, and this is key, shutting the doors for us for walking into sovereignty and freedom. What was on the other side of the Jordan River? What was on the other side of the threshold? The other side of the threshold was genuine freedom. Genuine sovereignty. What does sovereignty mean? I am in charge of myself. I determine my life, my needs, my choices, and how it is that I respond to what it is that life brings me. That happens on an individual basis. It happens on a national basis. It happens on a community basis. It happens in every form of aggregate of human beings that we find ourselves. And what this is saying, what the Torah is telling us, is how I think of myself and how I perceive, therefore, others thinking of me completely defines the entire reality in which I live. Completely. So it's important to examine it. Here is the thing, this day is the day to examine it. It's one of the reasons why we engage in five deprivations. We take away the padding, the comforting, to sit starkly in my here and now. Feel what it is simply to be and not be distracted by external elements. Now, the amazing thing is to recognize that this was indeed a psychological experience, is that Yushua and Kaleb, as you rightly said, completely.
completely related to it in a different way. They didn't see anything that these people saw. They saw the same land, went to the same places, same tour, same food, same sedan, same everything. But on this day, when we're not eating, 
and we're depriving ourselves of these various things, turn the volume up on it a bit. Listen. How is it speaking? Do you want to adjust that voice in any way? Maybe it's too quiet a voice. Maybe it never speaks. Maybe it believes it should never speak. Question, what it is that sees you in your and what Harapan says about Teshubah, about returning, is genuinely that it's about a return. We know we know that he knows as I can. For him, this was everything. This was his core lesson of his life. Let us again, the Nasi of the Sunday dream. This to him was the core lesson of his life. It's the one thing that in the recorders of the Kayabot that he used to always say. What did he say? Can we get it back? The broadcast? What did he used to always say? I can. Always said, Iman Anili. He said that. He said, if I am not going to be mine, live my life, be for me, no one will. He came to that realization emphatically. That is Himel as a man, the Nasi of the Sunday. He further said, when he was at the Simhat Betashoeva on Sukkot,
you imagine it every mm -hmm. single day that way. So when we talk about Teshuva, it seems like, it sounds like that our, our entry into Rosh Hashanah Kippur that we begin here now today is a return to self. The self that God created. The self that is whole and full and real and worthy and valuable. One of the most beautiful things that I've seen on this was from Rav Cook. Rav Cook writes it astonishingly. There we go. I'm going to read this with you. I'm going to stand here. I want you to take a look at it. Rav Cook says, Kishochechim et machut haneshamah atzmit. When we forget the essence of the personal soul, that soul that we say every morning is pure. When a person gets distracted from looking inside into the life that is internal to oneself, everything becomes confused. A teshuvah harashit, he says, the primary teshuvah, the most high, first step of teshuvah, is one thing that lights up the darkness immediately. The person should return to oneself, to one's true self. The roots of his soul, and she will immediately return to her God. In the the soul of all souls. Now look what he says over here, because with this we're going to transition to our close. The bold. He says, I want you to know that when we talk about human beings, we talk about individuals which come together to make up groups. And the groups are always more than the sum of their parts, but nonetheless are made up of individuals. And he says, for an individual to come back to his or her self, to genuinely see his or herself, to cultivate it, to embolden it, to enliven it, to cultivate it. That helps the aggregates. It helps the groups. And he says, the Varzeh, this, Noheg ben Mirish Yahidi, it's for individuals, ben Be'am Shalem, entire nations. Ben Bechol Ha'anushiyot, for mankind. Ben Tikkun Kol Ha'vayat Kola can help the entirety of existence. Do you hear what he's saying? If you think I'm exaggerating, Rav Kook is saying to the degree that we are integ have our own integrity, that we return to the authentic self and build it and hold it because it is what God created, it affects the entirety of humanity and all it is. Certainly, our families, our communities, our nation. And so it's important for us to remember that this is not a small thing. That to be able to genuinely ask, how do I see myself? How do I treat myself? Is not a selfish question. It's a mitzvah, as he really as I can show us. Perhaps one of the greatest mitzvahs. Why? Because it's what I wish about created. He created us to be the first word in Ma'asev Rashid. The first command of Maaseh Rashid is simply Yehi, be. And what we know is that no one else can be for us. And it means that we have to genuinely think about how am I thinking of myself? How do I treat myself? And how does it manifest in my life and those around me? How do I expect that my children see me? How do I expect that my spouse sees me? How do I see my friends seeing me? How do I see my co-workers and employees seeing me? How do they see me? First answer to that question, how do I see me? And if there are any issues and discrepancies in any of those or other relationships, the first question is, how do I see me? That's the Shabbat. It's the Shodesh. It's the source of all of 
course in the disciple clothes. As it is with an individual, it is with the aggregate. It is important for us as a nation to be able to have that. And when I say nation, I mean the people of Israel, the Jewish people. And there is this recent situation that we have just been in, and I don't just mean COVID, I'm talking about the conflict, and where we saw that we were a bit off our, off our feet in terms of the onslaught of rhetoric that was coming, that, that was coming our way. I watched my youngest son, 14 years old. He is in bed. I tell you about the eye and excuse me. He is embedded in social media. And when he was hearing the rhetoric come back about Israel, he lost his footing. And he came to speak with me. And he said, Daddy, what do we say about this? Are we doing these things? Is this how we are? And I couldn't just say to him, no, Daniel, that's not how we are. Because he looked at me like, <laughs> I had to sit him down and I had to tell him the story. And I had to watch the stories presented online with him and show they missed this bit. <laughs> they conveniently left this bit out. Let me show you. I pulled it up for him. This is an addendum in terms of the aggregate. We need to make sure that we have full awareness of our whole worth and integrity, individually and nationally. And that means that for our children, for us as well, we need to teach them the history of the state and the events and how they progress. And we need to do it not only in terms of what we think it is, but what everyone else is saying. It's not happening in our schools. Not here, not in the UK. And I only say that to you because once I was a principal of a school. And I'm saying to you, it must be integrated because of this. And in that, we must remember, think about, hear the voice that is speaking to you in your mind. Listen to it. Let it speak, hear it. And if you can adjust the dialogue to grow, do it. It's good enough.